So warm good afternoon to everyone. And uh, this is Dr. Mayuri. And on behalf of Medical Learning Hub, we welcome you to the live event on improving ICU outcomes through remote monitoring and AI, a panel discussion supported by Medtronic. Now I'll take the opportunity to welcome our esteemed panelists for the day and introduce them. Our first panelist is Mr. Madan Krishnan, sir, who is Vice President and Managing Director at India Medtronics. He is an international leader with emerging and developed market general management experience. He, is, he has his proven expertise in market entry growth acceleration, M&A, corporate finance, SFE marketing, effectiveness, organizational transformation, channel strategy, and talent development. His specialties are in medic, medical device, pharmaceuticals, consumers, durables, FMCG, chemicals, and plastic. Plastics, audit, restructuring, SAP analytics. We welcome you, sir. Our next panelist for the day is Dr. Deepak Govil, sir, who is chairperson for the event. He is currently working as a director at Institute of Critical Care and Anesthesia at Medanta Med City Gurgaon. He is also president of Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. He is also a chancellor at Indian College of Critical Care Medicine and director at Win Focus ITO Delhi. His areas of expertise are in ventilation, hemodynamic monitoring, ultrasound, and sepsis management. Welcome you, sir. Our next panelist for the day is Dr. Dwaidit Chandra, sir, who is consultant onco-anesthesiologist and is working in Koyas hospitals. With his dedicated and caring approach to patients, he could make sure that each patient experiences very little discomfort during surgery and post-operative period. His special interest includes anesthesia for oncotransplant surgeries, critical care, and resuscitation. He has five academic publications and four academic presentations at national level. Welcome you, sir. The next panelist for the day is Dr. Phillips Matthews, sir, who is Deputy Director at Innovations and Partnerships at Believer Church Medical College Hospital, Kerala. He is a passionate doctor with extensive experience in critical care and hospital settings. He adapts in properly diagnosing and strategizing for the best treatment plans for patients. He is effectively leading. One second, why the poll came out? He is effectively leading innovations and sustainable partnership projects to create an ecosystem where healthcare and technology can co-develop for providing quality care to society in an affordable way. We welcome you, sir. Our next panelist for the day is Mr. Rajiv Sikasa, who is a group CIO of Medanta Hospitals. He repeatedly proven energetic senior leader with an obsession for technology. Mr. Sikas' core strength lies in formulating and executive, executing enterprise-wide IT in conjunction with business spanning, multi-years covering infra application security, compliance, business continuity, operations, and partner ecosystem. He has executed large-scale across countries, multi-year programs involving heterogeneous technologies varying from package applications to custom built to cloud. He has implemented projects in emerging technologies comprising VR, big data, IoT, and AI. We welcome you, sir. Our next panelist for the day is Mr. Prashant Singh, sir, who is director and CIO at Max Healthcare Hospital. His expertise in commissioning and operationalizing information technology setup for Greenfield Hospitals and technology revamp in Brownfield Hospitals. He has strong people management and leadership capabilities. His specialties lies in lead technology strategy for healthcare organization. Welcome to the event, sir. Our next panelist is Mr. Prashant Krishnan, sir, who is Senior Director and Head at Surgical Patient Monitoring and ENT at Medtronics. He, uh, he has experienced business and thought thought leader in the medical device market. He have managed business through various stages and handled complex business challenges in medical device industry in India. He delivered strong growth, profitability, and developed talent across India and the US markets. He, his experiences in interventional cardiology, minimal invasive surgery, orthopedics, and bleeding management, and creating new go-to market models to create accelerated growth. Welcome to the event, sir. And now I'll quickly read the agenda for the event. After the introduction, I'll hand over the stage to uh, Mr. Gurpreet, who will be inviting Mr. Madan Krishnan for the inaugural session. After that, Dr. Deepak Govil will be addressing us on state of remote monitoring in ICU. Um, 
After that, uh, Mr. Gurpreet, who is the moderator for the session, will be introducing about stasis and will continue the session on the panel discussion on role of remote monitoring in improving ICU patient outcomes. If you have any questions, we request you to type in Q&A section. Our panelists will take the questions after the panel discussion. At the end, Mr. Prashant Krishnan, sir, will be sharing vote of thanks with uh, all of us, and we will be raising the second poll. General instructions for all the participants. All the participants will be muted during the webinar. If you have any queries, please type in Q&A section. If you have any comments, please type in chat sections. Queries and questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar by the moderator. We are recording this session and the recording will be available on Medical Learning Hub platform in few days and we will be notifying you via emailers. As you can see, we have raised the first poll. We will be raising the second poll at the end of the session. I'll take another uh, minute to introduce about Medtronic and stasis. Medtronic begins its operations in India in year 1979. It has its headquarters in Mumbai and has various city branches in across the India. Medtronic has recently collaborated with stasis to redefine patient monitoring in India. The stasis monitor is centralized monitor system that automates and digitalizes monitoring documentation and communication of critical care patient information used in emergency ICUs, surgical ICUs, and high dependency units, step down units, and private patient rooms. The stasis monitor comprises a bed monitor that tracks six vital signs and a tablet and a cloud connected app that enables remote monitoring across the devices. The platform can provide patient data to any device through the cloud and includes better backup to move patients between different care areas with 24 hours vital sign trend data and AI powered proactive alerts. With this, I stop my sharing my screen and would request Mr. Gurpreet to please take the stage and welcome Mr. Madan Krishnan for the inaugural ceremony. Over to thank you. Thank you, Vyuri. It is indeed a virtual stage, so to speak. And I would really like to thank the 90 participants, attendees who have joined us among the gazillion things that they could do on Saturday. They chose to spend the time with us, and I'm really thankful to them. And I can assure them this will be worth your time. So, without wasting any further time, I would like to invite Mr. Madan Krishnan, who is the MD and Vice President, to inaugurate the event in Paris. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Gurpreet, and uh, warm good afternoon to everyone. Uh, special welcome to our uh, esteemed chair, Dr. Deepak Govil, to the panelists, esteemed and uh, respected panelists, Dr. Philip Matthew, Dr. Dudeep Chandra, Sri Rajiv Sikha, and uh, Sri Prashan Singh, and also to the all uh, esteemed members of the fraternity, clinical fraternity, the clinicians uh, who are on the call also to Dr. Mayuri Keskar and the team organizing this event. So I'm, I'm sure Medtronic is not a new name to any of you. You're all seasoned clinical experts in the country. And I want to start with a great word of uh, you know, gratitude. Over the last 18 or like getting closer to now 20, 20 plus months, they've gone through a period of maybe nightmare and now we are trying to get our lives back. But the on the front line of all the effort for the pandemic, what you all have been in the front line and your teams, the efforts and the actions taken by you are heroic and the whole country and the whole world is showing its gratitude. So I'm, we have also supported in our own humble way, but I think that, that is just to enable you and enable the other clinicians and the hospital teams to address this massive uh, pandemic that, that is impacting us still. So again, thank you and all the, all the gratitude to you. So Medtronic, seven decades globally, started in a humble manner. Our founder, Earl Bakken, invented the first battery powered pacemaker seven, more than seven decades ago. And we are, as you saw in the last slide, more than 40, 42 years, we are active in India. And I think just, to, I want to spend a few minutes because the broad therapy range of Medtronic, it started as a cardiac and vascular company but you know, right from our pacemakers, which started defining us to various types of aortic peripheral coronary related products. We have a very strong uh, portfolio of neurological products, which is also detailed here. And in the imaging side or the navigation neuromonitoring side, and after that, uh, an integration of Covidian, we are also a very strong presence in the medical surgical space from all the energy, Valley Lab energy platforms to our, our own uh, very, very dear uh, 
you know, uh, products in our patient monitoring, respiratory products, Nelcor, Virutin Bennett are all, you know, more known to you than even us in Medtronic because you have uh, reposed your faith in those products. And diabetes also, we are again a very strong organization. Recently, we launched the hybrid, the most advanced hybrid closed loop pump in India last week, which has also been received well. So the essence of Medtronic is all about how do we work with the clinicians like you, bringing technology and innovation to alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. That's the whole essence of Medtronic. We'll be successful through that partnership with clinicians, bringing new innovation, and a combination of invention, innovation, and disruption. We continue to also disrupt our own products. I'm happy to see two respected CIOs joining the panel. And I tell you, this is a unique opportunity for MedTech, the classical MedTech with great advancements in miniaturization, material science, and in the battery technology is reinventing itself, possibly every year or every two years. But data, artificial intelligence, and technology is also bringing a new dimension, which is allowing us to even go much faster and into areas which were not earlier possible to bring effectiveness to. So I'm really happy that this combination of the traditional medtech with the new new age uh, technologies uh, in visualization in remote monitoring will take us much much forward faster and in the next slide we have a good news to share over a long prolonged effort we have successfully established the largest r and d center of medtronic outside the united states in india in hyderabad now i am very close to saying that this is the largest single R&D center for Medtronic anywhere, but we are maybe we are a few more hundred people short of that. Within the last few months, we have ramped up to 600 technologists, and I'm sure 800 and 1,000 is very much in sight. We are looking for expanding the facility now. And I think, again, a very proud achievement is that during the pandemic, the center worked to create remote monitoring capabilities for our flagship, the most advanced P Puritan Bennett 980 ventilators for US market. And recently Prashant shared the good news that PB980 is also now started getting access to the medical colleges and you know to the government segments in India. This is the standard very well accepted in the US and with remote monitoring, it brings a di different dimension to us. But what is the power of the engineering talent here? India has the best of medical talent, clinical talent. How can we combine with our engineering talent and also provide new opportunities to innovate in a, in a manner that is relevant for India? And a couple of areas I want to call out to esteemed audience is that during the pandemic, our team has also deployed thousands of ventilators across India. And out of that thousand ventilators, Prashant and the team have placed across India, the eight PP Bennett 840 ventilators, which were secured through donations from the US. So we worked with the US Chamber of Commerce and facilitated a significant amount of donations from the likes of the CEO, like the Sundar Pichais and uh, other Indian uh, CEOs of Indian origin came together, created a consortium and we facilitated that donation, which has been very well received. Right from the most rural villages in Northeast to Ames in Delhi, we have deployed our units. So I'm really privileged, at least we could do it in our humble way, but this chapter is also extremely exciting for me. We are tying up with the startup to bring in a product which will also fill a gap that is needed in India and in the world. How can we leverage our heritage technology with the startup's capability into data, artificial intelligence to provide remote monitoring, which will be effective for you to treat more patients in a more cost effective, more clinically also effective way, given the constraints of our resourcing and our you know, infrastructure, I believe this will be a quantum leap. So I would really appreciate all guidance, all the support guidance and also inputs so that we can further improve this platform. How can we integrate our own Nelco technologies, our own technologies in the patient monitoring uh, areas together with our ventilators and other products to serve you better? So that journey will continue but only your guidance and support will make it even more faster and more ambitious in that journey. So I want to wish everyone a good meeting. And again, my gratitude and my appreciation for all the great work that you and your teams are doing. Thank you and Jai Hind and back to Gurpreet.
thank you sir for sharing your thoughts indeed uh, mi mic in hyderabad is one of the proud jewels of metronic and of india as well and now i want to invite dr deepak govel to share his views on state of remote monitoring in the icu dr govel over to you sir i think you are on mute Have we lost you, Mayuri? I'll just call him. Uh, yes, sure, 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 sure. Doctor, just dialing in again. So let's give it a minute. Uh, sorry, guys, for the glitch. Uh, you'll be joining in a moment. Sorry, Zio. Yeah, I am extremely sorry. Somehow the connection was lost in between, and I couldn't start. So, first of all, I would like to thank entire team of Metronics and this um, uh, program to invite me here, and uh, so that I can express my uh, some of my thoughts. And thanks to Mr. Krishnan for introduction of the Metronic. So the thing is that. uh this pandemic everybody has suffered from this pandemic this pandemic has brought the limelight uh, on the critical care everybody was knowing about the critical care and intensive care units earlier also but this pandemic has brought them into limelight side by side it another phase has come out that it, there is a gross shortage of the trained manpower and be it a metros forget about the tier 2 and tier 3 cities where these critical care services are uh, almost negligible or almost non existent so this again brings to uh, another question then how can we fill this gap i know the trained manpower cannot be produced in a minutes or hours or uh, months it takes years to produce trained manpower here is the uh, uh, role of uh, remote monitoring comes in with the help of remote monitoring we can reach out to those areas where there is no trained manpower one can monitor the patients then and there and then can suggest the line of treatment and can monitor the progress and can intervene when it is needed and suggest them to uh, do the right intervention at the right time so that patient's life can be saved and side by side we can monitor them and can suggest them to shift them to higher center if needed if that facility is not there so the first remote monitoring started at the home only whenever in the icu we see a central monitor that is a smallest easiest type of a remote monitoring rather than looking at the bedside para multi para monitor we sit in the central nursing station and look at the remote monitoring that's how the remote monitoring has started with the newer technology it can be done on the wireless basis and uh, through the wifi and it can be connected to our mobile anywhere and sitting at the right at the home we can see but still in india the penetration is not there that much of penetration is not there we need a wider penetration of this technology wider penetration of this remote monitoring so that more and more patients can benefit with less resources apart from the vital monitoring there are in icu there are many life support systems as well if we can connect those life support system to this monitoring then it becomes a totally integrated system where rather than looking only at the blood pressure or the pulse rate or the ecg of the patient one can even look what oxygen is going on what how much ventilatory parameters are what is patient's own effort and so many things like urine output like his blood sugar those things can be integrated with this remote monitoring and then will it will become a complete package and it will uh, it will help not only the patients but the clinicians as well side by side it remote monitoring or any monitoring generates lots of data if we start feeding that data back to the machine learning 
then probably we can create good algorithms. These algorithms can help in a predicting any catastrophe. So for example, we can have a shock uh, algorithm where we can, machine can predict that now this patient has got this much of chances in develop, developing septic shock or a cardiogenic shock, that type of thing can be done. So with this advance in technology and coming in um, this um, artificial intelligence, what I feel that there is an immense possibility and immense opportunity for remote monitoring and the future lies here only of the critical care. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Indeed, uh, remote monitoring can bridge the gap between the, the that has been created with less number of doctors and more number of patients, the doctor patient gap and remote monitoring can bridge that gap. And thank you for sharing your views. So uh, now going forward, I'm going to introduce the product uh, which Metronic has partnered with Stasis. And uh, I'll show you what this product is all about. And I'm happy if anybody have any questions about it. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, Gurpreet, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so the product that I'm going to talk about is called Stasis, which is again a remote monitoring platform, but it's a remote monitoring platform, which is very simple and simple to connect because the challenge that we have particularly seen and observed over a period of time is the complication that are associated with remote monitoring. And remote monitoring has been a buzzword from quite some time now. We have been talking, listening, hearing, reading about remote monitoring across various verticals. Uh, in the healthcare space, whenever you log into any healthcare website, you will find a discussion and the article about remote monitoring. Remote monitoring has really proven to deliver higher quality of care at the lower cost. In the study that happened in US, it actually results in 86% reduction in the code events, 48% reduction in the ICU transfers, which is very important at this point of time, and it also resulted in 10% reduction in the length of stay which currently observing the loads on the ICUs and the step down also could be a significant milestone. Now, of course, it also helps you save cost up to $1.4 million in the study that was done and saving cost is always a positive thing. But the penetration of remote monitoring hasn't been, I mean, I would say there's still a long way to go. And some of the challenges when we introduce a lot of CIOs, CTOs, doctors, when we include a lot of other HCPs also, we found out that there are three major problems that are associated with implementing any remote monitoring platform and which are deterrence to the high adoption rate of remote monitoring. One is the lack of IP infrastructure. Of course, with the stress on the bottom line of every hospital, having the people added into the hospital and the IT team to implement a remote monitoring platform doesn't seem feasible. So there's a lot, lot of IT infrastructure required, there's a lot of team management required in order to run this kind of a system. So this turns out to be one of the biggest difference for any hospital when it comes to the remote monitoring adoption. The second is, of course, which is linked to the above point, which is cost prohibitive and it is a limited available connected device. So the current solutions that are available cost a lot and they usually ask for pay per user model and uh, you have a limited number of devices that can be connected and not everyone can have an access and if you want to extend it by even one user you have to pay extra so that is the cost which is always there and which remains our second biggest difference when it comes to the remote monitoring the second is of course we want to have remote monitoring to bridge the gap what dr google highlighted there's a number of patients and there's a few number of doctors who have to manage these patients, especially it got exposed during this COVID-19 pandemic. And But some of the solutions that are currently available are so compl complicated and they have the, such a restrictive clinical workflows that it becomes very difficult to actually uncomplement them and use them in a day-to-day -day practice and use them for a decision making. So these are some of the challenges which we could identify. So what would be the solution? The solutions are very simple. The first solution is the solution should be cloud-based. There should not be any IT training required to deploy such solution. Such a simpler 
remote monitoring platform that each and every hospital out there, even if it's a big hospital or a small hospital, should have access to this technology because you do not need a big IT infrastructure to deploy it. One of the one of the solution is this. The second is, of course, the medical device industry as such is a very capital intensive industry, and every year hospitals have to budget if they have to really get a new technology or a new device into the hospital. So in a remote monitoring platform, you can have a software first approach, which is very cost effective. You can have a very cost effective internet to trade hardware. You not rely on the capital so much that you prevent the patient access to these technologies. It has to be a software first approach and softwares are available. And hence the, the hospitals can implement this technology very cost effectively. The third point is the clinical data should be available on any device. Anybody who really wants to access and know about the patient, who deserve to know about the patient's status, should be in a position to access this data. And in any environment, it does not necessarily mean that you should be connected to the VPN of the hospital. You should be in the vicinity. It should be very uncomplicated, as I put it. The clinical data should be available in any environment. If we could find out, if you could implement these solutions, the remote monitoring platform can really take off and can be a next healthcare technology. However, uh, the market is currently cluttered, I would say, with these devices. These are rigid. Uh, you cannot really implement. There is no much innovation that has happened over a period of time. And hence, we are kind of stuck with this kind of a solution. And this is one of the biggest reasons why the remote monitoring penetration is split on the left side. Right? However, if we enable hospital monitoring tools to deliver flexible and data driven approach, right? If we have an approach of collecting the device and a cost effective device system, moving that data from the device system to cloud in order to analyze it, but also use AI algorithms to actually present that information to the doctors on their farms in a very concise manner, in a very actionable manner, then it becomes very effective. And of course, you can access that data, not on that rigid big device, you can access that data on your mobile phone, on your screens, on your laptop. And of course, I was talking to Mr. Prashant yesterday and he highlighted that the integration is also one of the important points. And if a solution can deliver that integration, that could be very beneficial and can really rapidly increase the adoption of the network. And that's exactly what Stasis offers. Stasis has a very simple monitor. This monitors measures the heart rate, blood oxygenation, ECG, respiratory rate, blood pressure, and temperature. This is a very simple looking monitor, but it gives you all six vital parameters. It shows different, different colors. Green, of course, means you are absolutely fine within the range. If it is yellow, then of course, with some point, you need to intervene. If it is red, it is out of your limits, and the doctor has to come and intervene with the patient. So that's a very simple device. Now, I know the the traditional way of looking at a patient's vitals is to look into the screens and the graphs and the numbers. But there is a tablet. It's not a rigid screen that we are currently using. It's a tablet which you can move around. The tablet can be placed below the monitor itself and the doctor can actually, or the nurses or any healthcare providers in the vicinity can actually see all the historical trend, all early warning scrolls enabled by the AI artificial intelligence. And of course, the customized alarm threshold for patients and also, they can automatically document vital things to increase the nursing productivity. The tablet will be there as well to look at in a traditional way how the waveforms are looking at the doctor. But this is not it. Here is the good part. This data coming from these two devices can actually be integrated into a bigger screen, be it at the nursing station, be it at the nursing room, or be it at the HOD room or a department room. Each and every patient can be viewed, the vitals of that patient can be viewed in a very simple and concise manner. It can provide global view of patient recovery. It can easily help you identify risk and delay. The early warning scores can be seen and it can help you identify the risk before time. You can view patient trends and alarms. You can print these very easily. You just connect your laptop to the printer, which is usually done. And you can print it into the paper records as well. And the best part is you can deploy as many dashboards as needed. So for one ICU, for one ICU, you can have 20 dashboards also. If you need it. One can be in the 
nursing station, one can be in the HODU, one can be in the department room, one could be in the nursing room. So as many dashboards can be deployed. And this is what the software approach, software first approach that I was talking about. And of course, this is just not it. We have the remote monitoring app also called this Casey app. Now, in the on the mobile phone itself, if you're part of this conversation, you can easily, if you want to look at some patient, you can easily take out your phone, look at the app, and you can easily see what are the vitals of that patient. The data is directly coming to your mobile device, and you don't need to be in the vicinity of the hospital. It means you are not required to be connected to any VPN or any server for that matter. It will automatically pull data from the cloud, and you can easily see. You can see the insights and mobile devices, patient trends and waveform, triage of patient based on risk. And of course, there is no limit to users per facility. You can have as many doctors, as many nurses to have access to this application. Of course, the hospital will have to authorize it. And of course, we have the early warning score powered by the AI. Now, of course, the question comes of uh, the data security. I mean, this is the real question. There's a gigabytes of data being generated in any hospital. It has to be encrypted. Nobody would want to share the data with other people, those who are not, do not deserve to know. So this data goes to the Amazon Web Services. The Amazon Web Services, as you know, is one of the best cloud services available currently in any shape and form, and it is end-to-end -end encrypted. So your data is secure and only those people who have access and been authorized by the hospital can see the data. So data privacy is the utmost priority and it is there with this case of one thing. There are many, many hospitals who are currently using it. Just a vote of thanks to all those hospitals. If you are from one of those hospitals, I sincerely thank you. Apollo, Fortis, Kaveri, we have installations with hospitals like Ames, Rishikesh also. So those hospitals are already using, being trusted with this case of one thing. There is one independent five month peer reviewed which we published clinical study in India and which we found out that there is a four times reduction in the cardiac arrest while implementing this cases platform. There's an improved patient experience. 76% of the patient skipped the ICU entirely. And of course, there was there's a lower cost of care, 80% reduction in patient cost. Hence, in turn, 90% clinical satisfaction is outside of ICU. So this is what the peer review article showed, which boosts the confidence that this particular device and remote monitoring can actually grow leaps and bounds and can be accessed by each and every patient. So this is it about the remote monitoring platform, the stasis platform particularly. And I just wanted to show it to everyone so that they understand that this is one of the monitoring solutions which are currently available. Right. So now I'm going to move to the panel discussion, which everybody is so waiting. And uh, I want to again thank each and everyone uh, to be part of this conversation. And this is a very important conversation. I was just reading the chat and somebody mentioned this high time and need of the hour and we feel the same. And that's why we have invited a lot of good panelists here. Dr. Deepak Govil, of course, is the chairman, is the chief panelist. And then we have Dr. Didi from Kerala, from Ghana's hospital. And then we have Dr. Philip, and we have Mr. Prashad and Mr. Rajiv Sikha, who are the CIO and CTOs of uh, Max and Miranda Hospital, respectively. So my first question would directly go to Dr. Philip. But, but first of all, I want to assure Dr. Philip will be able to hear me loud and clear. So Dr. Philip, can you hear me? So kindly unmute yourself, Dr. Philip. Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Good day, please. Wonderful, wonderful, sir. So my first question is to you, sir. Uh, since you have been a user of uh, stasis monitoring, so how is your experience in your hospital and how stasis implementation in your hospitals has improved the care delivery and how it has helped to make the right decisions? Sir? I have been using uh, stasis for the past three years. <clears throat> three years or more, three, three and a half years. Uh, since they first came to Kerala. Uh, we, the main area where we use is, we don't use it in the ICU, we use it for step down purpose. So we, we have deployed it in our wards and we've got HDUs. And there's a new concept that we tried with stasis, that is something called a ward HD. So we've got, being a teaching hospital, we've got wards and private rooms. 
So we have uh, segregated, we have earmarked around five beds in each ward, and we have put stasis monitors, and we have given an escalated care to those five beds. And these five beds would be monitored by the medicine SR or uh, whoever is the, I mean, if it's a surgical ward, it's a surgery SR, whoever it is. And it's placed near the nursing station as well. So the nurses can also have a look at what is going on if there is a malab. Uh, there's an extra nurse posted for this five nurses, five beds. So that is one, one thing that we did with stasis. That is a uh, uh, ward HDO concept. Another thing is, uh, uh, so with this, we were able to prioritize the care. We were able to consolidate resources. These are the main two things that happened with all the, all these patients were scattered in, across these 30 beds or 60 beds and no one knew where they were. We had to run around with code blues. Now they are all prioritized to these five beds and we were able to consolidate the resources and manpower. Again, we have kept two stasis or three monitors, three units per wards or per um, private segments, private uh, wards, so that in case the nurse feels that there's a problem with the patient, they can immediately, they don't have to ask anybody. They can just connect and then inform the respective doctor that I've connected this patient onto the monitor. You please have a look from wherever you are. And then they will keep giving instructions or the next doctor will come immediately and have a look. And then the patient is again on, on uh, again on a monitored bed. So we know that the patient is uh, in, in, in a safe zone. The other areas that we, I think, uh, that is how, uh, I, I think I have answered your question, Gurpay. Yeah, definitely, sir. And I was just coming to the other areas of care, and I think you have mostly answered it. But my follow-up question to you, sir, is um, uh, how important is to uh, implement SOPs in place for remote monitoring care once you have it installed in your hospital? Um, see, so the first thing that we did when stasis came in is to sensitize or train all our nurses and doctors about early warning scores. I mean, we have all learned of EWS, but how, how good are we at implementing that at the gra grassroots level? I'm very doubtful. So first thing is that we started training all these nurses and uh, that is when they got the idea of when to escalate. It's not when the patient is in dire emergency that you have to escalate. So, that once that concept came in, the care delivery became more important, I mean, uh, more streamlined. So then we set up like uh, early warning. So we customized the score to our hospital setting. Uh, if you check the Western scoring system, it's after seven or 10 that uh, the patient is being shifted to the ICU. But here we have kept it somewhere around five to seven. Anything between one to four is green then goes to orange and red. So between five to seven, uh, the treating doctor can take a decision whether to shift the patient or if one of the intensive care uh, doctor is available, they will go around and see the patient. So setting up an SOP is very, just by having a remote monitoring system, go and push the patient onto a monitor doesn't save lives. You need to tell your staff, your doctors, your junior doctors as to when and how they have to escalate care and what they have exactly have to do. Now, once we have done this, the main uh, benefit that we were able to get is we have freed up ICU beds. Now, the surgeons are more confident of taking care of the patients in the, uh, in the wards or rooms. The post-op beds are not stuck. The patients moved, are moved out of the ICU probably in 24 hours, they go to their rooms and they are being monitored. The surgeons monitor their patients. I mean, uh, especially uh, gastro surgery or neurosurgery, they are shifted out of the ICU in 24 or 48 hours. And, but still they are, they are worried about the patients. They can see uh, probably up to seven o'clock, 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, as long as the surgeon is awake, they will have a look at their patients. They will get their, their alerts and then they inform the junior doctors to have a, have, an, have a look at the patient or call up the uh, nursing station and say, you need to do something or whatever it is. But then sometimes we, even we get a call, uh, Philip, just have a look at this patient. 
looks like he's having some tachycardia or something. Then even we, I mean, if I am on duty, who is a consultant on duty in the intensive care, they get a call because we have shifted this patient 24 hours before to the ward or to the room. So that, that ecosystem has created confidence in the, uh, in the hospital as a whole for all doctors and nurses. Now the nurses know when, what to do. They're not blamed for a cold blue. They're not blamed for a deteriorating patient. They know when to do, when to escalate. And so, so we have uh, freed space in the post-op. We have created more HDU uh, beds. And now we have spared the level three ICU beds for uh, the sicker ones. And no one is in the ICU just for observation nowadays. So that was one practice that we could change. And uh, I should say that the code blues have definitely come down uh, by around uh, 40 to 50 percentage uh, than, I mean, during the COVID it was tough, but before that uh, it, it had come down uh, considerably. And now we have moved on to concentrating the code blue team as an RRT team. RRT is there, but now they do uh, the calls, something similar to an RRT and not as a code group. That is something that, uh, so the three things that has come up is with the SOP and the remote monitoring, these are things which has uh, made a big difference. Wonderful, Dr. Philip, and thanks for sharing your experience. Of course, the reduction and significant reduction of code blue is something that it is very important and, I, and this is very encouraging also in my understanding. And of course, if you have more dependency units, if you have less patient going into the ICU, or if you are having those patients saying for a lesser amount of time, it can give opportunity for other patients to come in and the churn can be the more patient can be treated in the hospital. So very and good the cost to the And cost to the patient has come down. I mean, the patients are not complaining that four days or five days of ICU stay and the bill is high. Now, 24 hours is a crucial period of 48 hours and then they are moved out and the cost is only about the HDO or the room or the ward. But we still have the monitoring available and they are under uh, con continuous care. Best cost is always encouraging, sir. <laughs> so thank you for sharing your view, Dr. Philip. I think this is very insightful. If I may jump to uh, Mr. Rajiv, I hope Mr. Rajiv, you can hear me. And uh, I, I, yes, I know the clear. depth of understanding you have in this particular topic. And uh, I, I read your article also. But my question is a little different. Uh, my question is related to the telehealth. And we heard the buzzard from uh, <coughs> Ms. Nirmala Sitaraman and she was talking about telehealth and investing in telehealth. So what do you think and how do you think that telehealth can be clubbed with remote monitoring and how it can improve the overall health care delivery? Sir? Sure. So am I audible? Yes, sir. I can. Sure. Perfect. So I think it is not a buzzword anymore. Uh, two, two and a half years of the experience which the whole world has seen. One thing is very clear that care away from the hospital is the new norm because no way on this earth, a country like India, and as a matter of fact, now the Western countries can think about building that infrastructure which can accommodate patients you know, of the time which we have seen during wave two and wave one. So care away from the, and just imagine that hospital like Vedanta who has built such a large infrastructure in five cities was also talking about care away from the hospital. So care away from the hospital because the need is that. Uh, so that says nothing but a telehealth at a global level and within the telehealth, uh, you have telemedicine, you have remote monitoring as one of the subset, you have uh, teleradiology, you have uh, you know vitals which are more through typical variables. There may be some intersection here and there, overlapping here and there, but that's the whole concept. Now, coming back to you know, your question, is it a buzzword? Answer is not, it's a buzzword. When during wave one, uh, government of India and Union Territory decided that we will come out with a quarantine method by which patients can be monitored at home. Nobody, you know, nobody was aware what to do in this. I know that I was part of the, you know, some of the uh, meetings at the civil session office we no symptomatic and it, it is tech is never sexy tech is never attractive you know what is more important is that how do you build a solution which is beneficial and easy to use 
within 40 hour, 48 hours, what we started doing is that we started enrolling patients and we did tens and tens and thousands of patients enrolled in this program during one and a half month where they were getting monitored by folks sitting in Mananta without actually going there. Obviously, all the protocols were in place. In case something goes wrong, you have ambulance back to the hospital. God forbid, you know, that should happen. Now, what was there in this? There were a couple of stuff. One is that, you know, a daily monitoring of certain vitals has to be captured. We were not having, you know, remote monitoring devices at that time. So we asked patient, we are sending you oximeter, we are thermometer is everybody home. There is a simple screen, you log in, you, once you log in, you see your own credential, you enter your details. And we were aware that whenever a threshold exceeds, decrease or increase below a given threshold, any vitals, an alert automatically goes to the doctor team and doctor will go into the call immediately with the patient. So that was the beauty. Second thing was that if for whatever reasons, patient is not able to enter the vitals. So operationally, somebody was calling. They realized that, you know, by this time, uh, there is an SMS which goes to the patient, still patient is not able to enter, somebody will call the patient. So it is a hybrid model, which means that half digital, half operational, but we were able to give a lot of confidence to the patient that it can be taken care at home, don't rush to the hospital, the way the uh, groups were getting blocked. So this is one simple example, but I think uh, when you talk about, uh, uh, you know, tele, so I'll give you an example of tele, ready, tele medicine. I just want to share that we started with telemedicine roughly three, four years back. It is not a video conferencing platform. For us, it's an integrated platform, which is integrated to seven systems in the back, including EMR. So, which means that whether a consult is done by the doctor in person in the hospital or in a remote camp or using telemedicine platform, doctor will be able to see reverse chronological order of the patient prescription in, in the way he or she wants to be. So, what happened is that we realized that Pre-COVID, somewhere March of 2020 to September of 2020, we have 12 times increase in the telemedicine concerts. So 12 times increase is, is a very significant jump. And there are four myths which got busted. And that's why I'm saying that telemedicine, telehealth is going to stay. And these are four myths, very important to understand. We did deep analysis and there are some papers which are published. It's there in Google, you've Googled it. Uh, so one was that it's a young people phenomena. No. Uh, we realized that more than 50% of the people were using it about 50 and age. I'm also 50 and age. So I you know, consider myself old. So that's one part. Second part is that uh, we thought that, uh, you know, it's a city, city behavior. 35% uh, of the people who were coming and using telemedicine were coming from Bihar, UP and Jharkhand. All three known you know, states are not known for high tech adoption. This myth get busted. Third was that, uh, uh, you know, old, sorry, uh, chronic disease patient, you know, uh, are captive. So they will only come to the, you know, respective hospitals because they have no other choice. We realized that more than 50% of the patients who were coming to telemedicine were totally new, which means that they also, you know, they are not looking to this. So whosoever has a telemedicine platform were able to do it. I think the fourth was that, uh, people who have serious disease, uh, you know, they uh, they will only come to, uh, uh, they will not come to uh, telemedicine platform, they will come in person. So even that get busted. Highest percentage was among the three serious specialties. So what I'm saying is that uh, both doctors and patient have realized that no point in, you know, coming if in person concern, wherever it can be avoided, let's avoid it. So this particular stuff, mainly will ensure that preventive healthcare and OPD settings will continue in the telemedicine platform, wave three or wave four, or hopefully no wave four, but post pandemic, this tele portion of the telemedicine, telehealth will continue. And similarly, you know, Dr. Govel, Dr. Philip talked about, there is no argument in discussing why we need uh, remote monitoring. Uh, I think this, this should not be point of discussion because we are all on the same page. We should argue, discuss when we have a different point of opinion. It's just a matter of time and also economics, which will play an important role. And Dr. Philip very categorically and very explicitly mentioned price points are getting decreased. And over the times, definitely with the technology improving, price point will get decreased. So remote monitoring and as Dr. Govil said in the addressal remarks, we have severe shortage of critical care doctors in the country. He says that it's there in the tier one cities, forget about tier two, tier three. 
So how do you match? How do you fill this gap? Traditional model by producing more doctors is not going to come in one year, two year, three year. It will take another four, you know, probably two or three decades. We all know the numbers which are there by DT or in multiple sites. It will take roughly three decades to meet the gap. So tech, if you have to scale it, you have to bring tech into picture. And tech is, according to me, nothing but telehealth. So FM was not making a buzzword. She was talking about reality. These ministers can't talk buzzwords. They have to talk reality. Absolutely. And I think I do agree with you. You raised a very critical two points. So one is the integration. And you said telehealth is just not limited to seeing the patient or monitoring the patient. It has to have a full system of integration as well. And I do agree with you. Remote monitoring without integration is nothing. I mean, it has to integrate with the whole system. And you also talked about the re reduced workflow for the doctors also. And even for the patients sitting there, they just have to monitor it and the doctors can pretty much see like what is happening. So thank you for sharing your view. I'll come back to you. I'll circle back to you. But uh, before that, I want to ask you one question to Dr. Dvideep. I hope, doctor, you can hear me. Dr. Chandra. I can hear you. I can hear you. Wonderful, sir. So, sir, how has your experience been since you've been also a user of remote monitoring, particularly stasis? And so, how has your experience been, especially during the pandemic time or otherwise as well? Sir? Yeah, exactly. I was uh, I was working with the SCG before and then shifted to Kerala in 2015. So that time uh, I got the idea of uh, using this remote monitoring uh, uh, in uh, from SCG. So once I shifted to Calicut, I wanted to continue the same uh, methodology of, for my patients in Calicut. So uh, in 2015, I started uh, three uh, three monitors in uh, Koyas Hospital, Kerala, Calicut. So to start with, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, resistance from the management side. They were worried about uh, whether uh, this particular thing is going to work and what the patient will think uh, because the uh, regarding the privacy of the data, everything. But over a period of time, everything was um, in very favor of uh, remote monitoring. And in five year time, we have seen uh, better access to the healthcare. There is improved quality of care and uh, there is totally peace of mind and uh, daily assurance for the treating uh, physicians as well as uh, the uh, ICU. Definitely, definitely. So and I do agree. Came back with my patient for 24 hours. Yeah. So finally, uh, when it coming to the peace of mind, I totally rely on stasis. They have this early warning scoring system and which promptly alert me when the patient is deteriorating. And um, we have even trained our uh, uh, nursing staff as well as the anesthesia assistants and uh, ICU assistants staff to uh, connect these monitors and uh, to see how uh, the trends are. And finally, the one of the most beautiful part is that I can integrate the uh, discharge summary of the patients with the uh, the things uh, with the uh, with the full patient data incorporated into the discharge summary from the ICU. So with all that, um, I think that this is a need of the hour that every patient should have to have get uh, this particular monitoring. One of the difference what I have seen is that uh, most of the people are using it for the HDU. And uh, for me, even I am using it for the ICU, except for the patients who are on in invasive monitoring because the stasis particular monitor doesn't have invasive monitoring things. But um, otherwise I am very comfortable in using even for the hemodynamically unstable patients and patients on multiple uh, supports and patients on ventilator. When they don't have an invasive monitoring lines, I prefer putting them on stasis because at the end of the day, I have uh, I can assess the patient data from anywhere in the world. And even I can see the trends and uh, even I can discuss the particular uh, patient progression with the patient uh, parties with that time I can show in my laptop or my uh, uh, iPad that uh, uh, this is the trend over the last 24 hours. And uh, uh, basically we are looking at uh, the, this particular problem in this particular patient and they are also very much convinced about it. So that is my experience. Even in, during the pandemic also, uh, we can actually reduce the actual manpower inside the ICU because we were working as team A, team B, and team C. 
so that time we had a cut short in manpower so that time we how we could uh, pull through the the difficult time is that with the help of the stasis monitor we can actually uh, cut down a lot of manpower and actual patient visit frequency also has been cut down intentionally uh, because uh, at, at the end of the day what matters is that uh, the patient should be uh, monitored 24 into 7 hours and they should be in safer hands so with the stasis we can actually achieve that particular target without actually visiting the patient on the bedside so uh, in the pandemic time also this is the ideal solution for managing uh, high dependency units and one of the thing I wanted to add to the point is that uh, this uh, stasis creates a lot of uh, data. Uh, so that can be uh, used for the education as well as uh, to get the feedback to the our system of care. So that is an actually a very added point. Our to use. Okay, thank you. I think these are really insightful answers, sir. Uh, so I just wanted to have a follow up question with you, sir. Did you also observe any reduction in code views like Dr. Philip? And uh, I've observed that the number of patients in the ICU is getting reduced and the length of stay is also getting reduced. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, that I can totally agree with the Dr. Philip in this particular point because um, the code blue has drastically has reduced with the help of this kind of monitor. Because what happened is like when the um, uh, so when something goes wrong, for example, a bradycardia or a transient arrhythmia happens with the patient, yeah. first thing is that it will get uh, notified to the uh, patient care unit as well as uh, the uh, the consultant. So even if the uh, uh, taking care uh, staff nurse has some doubt in diagnosing this particular condition, they can actually call over to you and tell that, sir, please see the monitor. This, this is showing some arrhythmia. So that time we can actually see the patient and even I can ask the cardiologist to pay a visit to the patient or take a 12 year ECG at that time. So with these kind of smaller, smaller interventions, we actually could reduce uh, number of uh, cold blue uh, uh, calls inside the ICU and the, sudden, the, the incidence of sudden cardiac arrest and uh, uh, the things have drastically come down after in, installing stasis monitor to our ICUs. Wonderful, sir. Good to hear that. Uh, my next question is to Dr. Deepak Govel, sir. I hope you can hear me. Uh, so you, you talked about the less number of intensivists and there's a huge gap between the patient and the doctors. Do you think implementation of such technology like remote monitoring can also, not in only the patient, can also help the clinicians maybe uh, reduce some of the workload because they are already so overwhelmed with the amount of work. So such technology and similar technology can help. So what do you have to do? So it's a, these technology is a double-edged sword. As you rightly said, that it can reduce the workload of the clinician as well. But again, there is no time limit. So if I'm sitting in an office or a hospital, I'm sitting in ICU. If I'm leaving a hospital or ICU at 6 p.m. in the evening, I'm off. But this technology, <laughs> all the <laughs> night things are there. So this is a flip side of technology as well, just in a lighter mode. But of course, it helps the clinician tremendously because during the night, if we get a phone call and there is a lot of anxiety, many times that goes away with this. And manpower shortage is always there. I know many of our colleagues and friends, they are doing this remote telemedicine, remote monitoring for US also sitting right at the India. And one of my friend was talking something different. So what he was talking that people in US, like the time zone is different from US and Australia. So they are remote monitoring the Australia and US uh, side by side. So things, this uh, it can have an immense opportunity and not only the immense opportunity, the immense benefit to all clinicians as well as the patients. Absolutely, sir. I do agree with you and we would not want you to be overwhelmed with the workload, sir. <laughs> I personally have called a lot of doctors in the night during the pandemic. <laughs> so I can understand your pain. So I want to come back to uh, Mr. Rajiv and uh, this is one important topic that I wanted to discuss uh, about the digital health. We've been hearing a lot about digital health. I'm sure at least to digital health, I can call it a buzzword. Um, do you see that a new phase of healthcare delivery and uh, how can it do the therapy outcomes? We, we do talk about digital health, but we have a very limited understanding. Sure. Uh, so may I? Sure, sure, sure. 
So, you know, when I joined Vedanta roughly seven years back, uh, I was told to come out with a uh, digital strategy for hospital. So I said, I know nothing about digital. Strategy is a bouncer and combined together strategy, digital strategy is a super bouncer, it's a googly. So let's talk about, you know, what you need stakeholder wise and let's try to see how tech can help in rolling out those use cases which are important and critical for each and every stakeholder. So patient is definitely at the center and then, uh, you know, in this particular case, uh, I'll share that uh, if you come to Medanta, you don't have to carry any of your reports, each and everything is there in this, whether you come in OP, IP, ER, uh, including X-rays are here, hopefully in days to come, we'll put up the URL link for CTA MRI also. So that you can download it as a diagram, including the diagram where wherever you want to. So this is according to me, you know, first example, very basic primitive example that instead of carrying loads and papers and prescriptions, you have each and everything. And God forbid, if you are moving between the cities, you don't uh, have to worry about carrying all those papers. And according to me, three four years back or five years back, when we were captive of all the mobile, Vodafone, Airtel, Zio, you know, you can't switch off. So this is a doctor portable. So, which means that digital will give you the fundamental rights of choosing your own doctor irrespective of it. So, let's you know, move away from the patient side, but also one more example of the patient which we realize is very important. ECG measurement is a very difficult job. Not each and every GP can measure and neighborhood doctors were missing for whatever reasons during the pandemic. So, what we did is that we have a remote device which was given to the patients. They monitor the ECG. And we do the base ECG in our system when we are rolling it. And within 30 seconds, the ECG is done. ECG report is there in the heart command center of Medanta. There is a 24 by 7 minimum consultant level doctor who is sitting there. The reports tell you that, you know, the, uh, any problems, all okay, problem or moderate. So in this particular case, any case, some consultant is looking at the report. He will, he will call the guy that, don't worry, everything is okay. It's just something else. Or you'll say that, you know, okay, something is wrong, but take take a pause. You can come tomorrow for OPD. You can come right now for an OPD. Meet your cardiologist. Third is that something is seriously drastically wrong. Rush to ER. Don't worry whether you have to go to Medanta or anywhere, but rush to ER. So just imagine that, you know, that's a that's an example of a digital health. I'll give you another example where we thought that uh, a patient were getting, you know, overwhelmed with the right contents during COVID. Uh, sorry to say, even a guy like me were, you know, asked, what is your you know, observation on this particular symptoms during COVID? Who knows? I have never read biology in my life. So there are too many, uh, too many information which was lying uh, in the Google world. So we, uh, Google and Amazon and us uh, combined together, we picked up the certain videos from our authentic doctors and we translated it into multiple languages. Uh, so, which can be, uh, and it was Google who was deciding that this video is authentic and let's translate it into seven or eight languages across the India. So, people, so simple tech and patients were getting overwhelmed with the right information. I'll give you, so nurses, nurses are like the most worked resources in any hospital, including Menatha. Okay. And most of the time they are doing, or half of the time they are doing non-clinical work, blanket, water bottle, tea is not there, uh, so all non-clinical work. What we did is that in the COVID ward, we put a Alexa video in each bedside and then a nursing unit has two larger videos, Alexa, one-to-one -one connected. So patient will say that, uh, hey Alexa or hey nurse, I need a glass of water. Nurse doesn't have to rush. It's a, it's a substitute of nursing bell, but in this particular case, as soon as the Alexa heard water, it will pass the message to FNB. FNB also has that same video and it will deliver. So water will be delivered to the, uh, to the, to the bed. So in this particular case, what we did is that we reduced drastically the nurse visit from the nursing counter to the COVID ward, which was like, we all know that at that time, what kind of resources. So this is a very simple tech. I'll give another example. Uh, Tele radiology, everybody knows in one of the hospitals, you know, uh, of Vedanta hospitals. All the doctors incidentally got infected in the radiology department. So who's going to do this? So technicians were there, but radiologists were not there. 
So tele radiology came into play, uh, you know, directly from the modalities. We moved those stuff into the packs uh, here, and then tele radiology started for that. I'll give one other example. See, all in the CT or uh, MRI, you know, when you patient goes on the table, a senior technician or a practice technician have to place the patient, so he is getting unnecessary exposed to that area. What we started doing is that we took a control of the modality. outside the hospital through a typical software in which technician doesn't have to be in the hospital with now this particular technology is definitely bound to stay after pandemic also technician can go home at 5:30 which dr deepak govil will not agree ki we are you know pushing them to the use of tech after 5:30 but just imagine that a serious trauma case is there and we need his help for 10 minutes instead of he coming all the way from his home he can take remote control of the modality and help nurse or the guy there to have the right position of the patient so in this so my definition of tech or digital tech is not about something sexy it is all about give me a use case and let's figure it out how to implement it be it remote monitoring or be it service excellence or be it a better clinical outcome which is a difficult subject because of the ai and machine learning but that's according to me some of these will definitely stay beyond pandemic and some are already in production for fairly long period Yeah, definitely, and I do agree with you. In fact, the genesis of this stasis remote monitoring happened like this only, where the patient could not reach the nurse on time. So, thank you for sharing the views. I can resonate. Uh, coming back to Dr. Dwiri, uh, Dr. Chandra, I hope you are there and can listen. Uh, in, I just wanted to ask you, since you have been using remote monitoring and the remote monitoring that you are currently using, stasis already have AI built into it. So has it affected your clinical decision making? Has it really helped you diagnose disease conditions at an early stage, and also uh, monitor patients suffering from chronic diseases? Yeah, mm, yeah, exactly. So actually, this um, uh, EW scoring system, which is AI powered, and um, advance the early um, recognition of the deterioration of the patient, actually, actually really helped me. there are few patients who doesn't want to stay back in icu uh, but still need monitoring for their uh, chronic illnesses and uh, most of them are uh, cancer patients and who are receiving end of life care so these patients we were able to put the monitor near the bed in their own uh, suit so in that way uh, when the patient started deteriorating to the uh, point where an intervention is needed so we can actually get an uh, early warning uh, from the monitor and we could uh, approach the patient and reassess the condition and if needed only we will ship the patient to the icu so that way the chronic patients everybody is getting more benefited with the ews and one more thing i wanted to add uh, we were uh, we used to visit few of the Uh, smaller clinics like uh, uh, hair transplantation clinics and uh, those kind of uh, skin clinics who doesn't have much of a uh, trained staff or who doesn't have uh, uh, these kind of uh, sophisticated equipments in their smaller clinic but they are still doing uh, procedures under local anesthesia uh, without actually monitoring the patient so uh, with the, uh, with the these kind of conditions uh, the management wanted us to see how more safety can be offered to the patients undergoing these smaller procedures so we had a discussion with the team and uh, then initially our plan was to train the full staff for the uh, how to, uh, connecting the monitor to the patient and reading and uh, seeing where the things are going wrong they should identify it early so that was the way we were planning to do it but later with the help of stasis what we did was we did a, a center console uh, we made a center console for uh, connecting these uh, four five hair transplantation centers and uh, with these kind of um, artificial intelligence enabled early warning system we could actually reduce manpower to Uh, much a very very uh, less number, and with the with with the people sitting in the central console, they could actually see the all the four centers uh, uh, procedure undergoing undergoing patients are 
having normal vitals and uh, things we could uh, actually able to pick up the patient who uh, were actually reducing the bp to a shock level uh, beforehand and we could intervene and save these patients from uh, ending up in a catastrophe in a small clinic so these ways these artificial intelligent enable the early warning system he is helping us to Uh, improve the patient safety even in even for the smaller clinics and uh, the uh, um, health uh, the these uh, skin uh, and uh, hair transplantation centers over to you Good. great sir uh, so before you go i know you have a patient waiting i just want to hold you for one second more uh there is there are some good questions that have come in the chat box and there is one question which is directly addressing you so the question is dr rivedi how do you follow up on a patient once they leave the hospital premises especially the chronic diabetic patients sir oh one one can you repeat the question once more so the question is sir how do you follow up on patients once they leave the hospital premises especially the chronic diabetic patients um actually with the with the respect to the stasis thing and the uh, home care thing uh our team does not have a home care facility with the monitoring system uh, i think somebody else in from the panel can address that uh, question because we don't uh, put monitor into the homes of the patient and we don't monitor them we our services were uh, uh, to the hospitals to the hdus and to the ward and addition to that these smaller clinics who, who is uh, uh, running hair transplantation clinics that's all thank you thank you doctor and i think i think uh, mr rajiv was talking about this uh, so rajiv do you think that there is a possibility that you, the telehealth or the telemedicine can be expanded once the patient is being treated and he is a chronic diabetic patient may require monitoring can be monitored directly in in spite of the fact that he is stable but may require monitoring and how does a holy hodi hospital would implement a remote monitoring into the regular follow up for such a patient was the lead the premises of the doctor so i will give you an example of myself being a patient not a clinician or a visitor of a hospital uh, i was in the early stages of diabetic and it was almost drifting towards the diabetic uh, type uh, so i had Uh, one of the device which was took it in the arm and for roughly each 15 minutes you know sugar readings were going to coming in a graph uh, i can see it doctor can see it and i was parallelly entering my you know all intakes whether i was sipping a cup of coffee or having gajar ka halwa no, sorry just an example but whatever nutrition i was taking you know and those were like i was feeding with respect to each every minute whether i had a half cup of coffee or a full cup of coffee and then after 5 days there was a correlation done between the sugar levels and my eating habits and then you know a nutritional okay suggested me something and within 6 months i was able to reverse it and then i had the similar experience of putting up the device one more time and now hopefully you know i'm this this has been reversed so th- this is an example which is short term i'll give you examples where there are like chronic chronic patients uh what i've seen devices and hopefully because according to me the next uh phase of telemedicine is the device integration of uh multiple types to the telemedicine platform according to me uh, there are two not the sugar reader sugar sugar reading or your bp reading because what happens is that even in the physical world when you come to and see a doctor you show your you know chit that these are my sugar reading these are my bp reading and doctor trusts you he's not he's not interested in how you took it he says that whatever is there on the piece of chit it's absolutely right he's not interested in experience what is more important in this case is that digital stethoscope where the experience comes into picture he wants to know hear your chest he wants to hear your lungs that's what the future integration of remote devices will be more practical for doctors uh, but coming back to you know for chronic cases there are multiple devices in the market they have a sim attached to that or a bluetooth enable to your app as soon as you took a reading on the device from the bluetooth it goes to your app and uh, from sim it goes because sim knows that which patient id is attached to that uh, sim Uh, in case of Medanta, that sim is one time registered with the UHID, and I will get all the readings. It goes into my EMR app. But I have not seen many usage of this 
you know, people are making their sugar readings and BP reading for ages on their diary and they show it to the doctor. But ultimately, some of these stuff will come to the app and immediate real-time intervention can be done on some of these chronic diseases. There are many, many products in the market. No, absolutely. And I do agree with you. And we do it for our cardiac monitoring also. Chronic patient monitoring is very important. And thanks for sharing your personal example with us. We have a couple of good questions. I want to go back to Dr. Philip. And uh, two of them are really interesting, sir. One is, of course, what is the cost of operating the system as a whole since you have been using the remote monitoring? The cost remains one factor. The second one is rather more interesting. Can remote monitoring system be connected to the patient's attendant mobile for his disease recent updates? So what's your take on it? I mean, the second one is a bit tricky, sir. <laughs> I would start with the second one. We would <laughs> never want the bystander to be aware of, not be aware, but it is not their job to do that. See, we've got nurses there. We've got doctors there on the floor. Now, why should, I mean, uh, okay, if, if they, they are anyway seeing on the tablet, if the, if the tablet is at the bedside, they can see on the tablet. But it's not necessary for them to activate the app on their phone. That is not part of the game. So, I think that's not required. Uh, can you repeat the first question, please? The first question is, what are the cost of operating the system? as a whole, what is your running cost when you use a remote monitoring, especially the stasis? Uh, I think it depends on the uh, contract you would have with uh, stasis. Uh, I think I cannot disclose it at the moment in an open forum like this. Yeah, sure. uh, but I think it is very reasonable because see, we are, I, I live in a place or my hospital is in Tiruvalla. Tiruvalla is a small town in Kerala. And the cost is one fourth. The IC cost itself is about one fourth of Cochin. Cochin is a metro. And probably that will be the Cochin rates would be half of Delhi or uh, one fourth of Delhi, probably. I don't know. Uh, so if it is affordable for me and for the patient, I think it should be affordable anywhere else. Uh, there are different, different uh, revenue models for the, for the product. For me, it has worked out very well because I was one of the first customers uh, and I specifically went behind stasis to come to Thiruvalla even before they came to Calicut or uh, Kuchin or Trivandrum. So I had that edge. And Gurbi, just to add to first question, uh, you know, with my almost negligible clinical knowledge, but more on the patient behavior side. See, uh, you know, when you give it to the hand of the uh, attendant, Doc, you know, he knows only hemoglobin probably. So he's looking at the hemoglobin has moved from 12 to 10 while doctor is treating kidney. Okay. So there will be all utter and confusion. So that's my view that it should not be given to the attendant. With this pure behavioral science, then clinical science. And I somewhat agree with you, sir. I mean, uh, I've, I've been selling SPO2 Nelcor and I've, the, the amount of calls that I usually receive, <laughs> it's at times... I take the things really, really far. My question, one question is to Dr. Deepak and it's an interesting uh, can question. I, uh, yeah. Just one, one more thing yeah. I would like to add. When again, uh, uh, Rajiv sir would uh, definitely agree to that. Every, when you say cost, affordability, it's all, it all depends on, I, I tell, I tell my management, one crash can actually crash the hospital's reputation. So, it is better that that is the cost of whatever you do. Uh, one bad name, and you will have to spend uh, lakhs on uh, setting it back to the trust that you want with the patient. So uh, the cost doesn't matter if you are looking at the care. I agree. I agree. Uh, so my the next question and probably the last question is to Dr. Deepak. Uh, with the capacity of uh, the president of ISCCM, sir. Uh, Dr. Manoj is asking, is there any type of workshop regarding remote monitoring in ICUs and AI currently being done? No, we are not having any specific workshop for remote monitoring and AI. But of course, in the forthcoming national conference, which is um, happening in April, from 8th, 9th, 10th April of this year only in Gandhi Nagar, we are having few lectures and few sessions dedicated to AI and the machine learning. So that would really help. I think this is need of the hours and thanks for addressing it. Uh, uh, Mr. Prashant could not be here, who is the CTO CIO of Max Hospital. And but 
uh, we were we were kind of expecting it. He mentioned that his board meeting is there and might get extended. So we had a recording of him answering two of the questions that I really wanted to ask him. So I'll request to Mayuri or anybody from MLS to kindly play that recording for the audience and uh, so that we can hear his views on remote monitoring as well. No, I'll do it right away. Sure. Just allow me a second. Um, is my screen visible, Gurpreet? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so just playing the video. So hello, Mr. Prashant, and thank you for joining the panel discussion on this very important topic, especially amidst this pandemic. And I'll start with my first question. Uh, so what are the challenges or the barriers you see in the widespread adoption of remote monitoring as a mainstream treatment modality? Remote monitoring has been a buzzword, but the penetration wise, it's still a long way to go. So what are your thoughts on that the challenges you might be facing uh, in the widespread adoption of uh, remote monitoring? Yeah, so uh, so Gurpreet, before I jump on to the challenges, basically I'll uh, take a few seconds actually in just describing what it means actually in simple language, basically. So uh, so remote monitoring as a uh, you know in what happens is the medical device you know it sends the uh, IT enabled data to healthcare system so that the clinician can monitor the patient basically very simple basically and there are many uh, uh, you know factors which is being monitored right like uh, uh, heart rate blo uh, blood glucose level oxygen level arterial pressure and uh, things like that and uh, see uh, you know the max point of view there are many use cases and out of uh, you know few of the use cases which we have uh, you know we are already using it uh, uh, at various uh, you know levels basically just to you know mention few basically we are using remote monitoring uh, for our uh, you know step down icu purposes where what happens is patients actually which you know who need uh, lesser you know attention from the icu or intensity point of view basically we we shift the patient to the wards and you know install these kind of devices so that the remote monitoring can happen and and little less icu care can be provided so that we can you know uh, save the icu uh, you know uh, timings uh, from the bed point of view and from the clinician time point of view now, uh, straight forward, coming on to the challenges, uh, Gurpreet, basically. So, uh, so looking at the entire gamut of uh, uh, this remote patient monitoring, so very large uh, and, uh, you know, high volume of data is, uh, you know, processed uh, uh, in the entire uh, this transaction, basically. So that is, you know, in my view, that is one of the biggest, uh, uh, you know, challenge. Uh, along with the clarity around regulatory license and medical legal aspect actually so this is one area and uh, coming on to the next one as for example uh, you know scalability and high availability is another uh, you know area which i see as a challenge actually because you know the moment uh, we we scale one particular you know model to the entire uh, enterprise wide basically so it actually poses that uh, you know challenge of high ability high availability and scalability so uh, and and going further basically uh, security and compliance uh, in in terms of sensitive data and privacy issue is another issue actually which uh, which i foresee uh, you know uh, for this kind of adoption, uh, adoption. so now uh, there are a lot of you know other issues uh, related with integration basically because what happens is you know uh, there are a lot of aggregation of uh, unstructured and structured data is coming from various format uh, uh, you know uh, into the entire storage and all basically that becomes uh, very very challenging at times basically and healthcare facilities you know may also need to adopt their workflows to new models as far as the delivery uh, you know is concerned basically and apart from all of this basically it uh, it uh, really needs an investment uh, from the it point of view that a hospital needs to actually do it basically so these are the few of the areas uh, you know in terms of challenges and barriers uh, which i foresee could be Thank you, Mr. Prashant. I think I do agree with you. Uh, scalability is a challenge. The current solutions are very cumbersome and takes a lot of time and investment from hospital standpoint. So I do agree with you. That's one of the bigger challenges. The solution should be simple in order to be scalable. So I do agree yeah. with you on this point. Uh, there has been a lot and of discussion. One, yeah. one more important point would be here is it has to actually talk to the existing healthcare uh, systems. It can't right. work in silos, basically. And that is another challenge actually which which is uh, you know everybody is facing right now 
Uh, absolutely. I mean, integration is one another point yeah. that you raise, and I think this is about it. So it's been one of the most important points. Right. And right. also, sir, uh, when it comes to remote monitoring, we have been talking a lot about AI, artificial intelligence. I mean, you log into Facebook, YouTube, wherever social media you go, everybody seems to be talking about the artificial intelligence. And uh -huh. now the healthcare companies are venturing into artificial intelligence. So uh -huh. how do you see, uh, what do you think is the role and impact of artificial intelligence in healthcare? especially see again uh, you know from the artificial uh, intelligence point of view basically uh, you know from the very simple layman language basically it analyzes the complex clinical data and convert it into the meaning meaningful information so that the better clinical decision uh, you know can be taken by the uh, care delivery stakeholders so this is very simple actually what it does basically and there are many uh, you know use cases uh, for example, Max Healthcare, there are seven, eight projects which are already running around uh, artificial intelligence, which, uh, uh, you know, gives uh, from radiology to other departments also, basically. And there are many use cases, like, for example, uh, in the pandemic, uh, you know, time also, basically, you know, many of uh, us have already realized, you know, what it does actually in terms of increasing the efficiency in terms of x-ray reporting specifically uh, you know which which everybody has uh, you know witnessed you know, and it really increases the efficiency and quality uh, you know time of the radiologist basically and uh, there are other use cases like you know it is being used in max scenario for brain volume in alzheimer's like you know osteoporosis uh, you know spine uh, brain bleed detection there are many other you know use cases and uh, the use cases actually which we are uh, you know already you know, doing a proof of concept kind of thing uh, for the disease prediction actually which we are uh, you know right now just testing uh, retinopathy everybody is aware you know it it uh, worked uh, wonders basically from the artificial intelligence point of view there are many other use cases actually which we are seeing that you know from the you know preparation of the discharge summary uh bill estimator uh you know use cases around you know goes around supply chain and things like that so these are the few use cases you know as far as you know the, the uh you know long-term impact uh you know point of view uh if we, if we talk about like you know the uh scarcity of the medical professionals is one of the area basically which is the cause of concern basically in healthcare industry and I see, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is filling that gap, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, reducing uh, their time in terms of diagnosis or, you know, analyzing some of the clinical conditions and all, basically. So it really, uh, you know, helps uh, creating an efficient healthcare model, which which I uh, foresee. And of course, actually, it, it giving a quality, uh, you know, to the healthcare from that point of view. Oh, I absolutely agree with you, Mr. Prashant. I think artificial intelligence provides information in a very concise manner, in an actionable manner, honestly. Yeah. And it really helps doctor make a quick and uh, right decision at the right time. So, right. so this was this was the two question I asked uh, Mr. Prashant, and I think as always, his views were really insightful, and we could learn. And it somewhat summarizes what we have discussed so far in the panel discussion. Also, the lack of healthcare professional, the gap between patient and doctors, and of course, the integration as one of the key parameters. Uh, so I just want to thank uh, the panelists for being here, spending one and a half hours with us discussing this critical topic. And I sincerely thank from the bottom of my heart, Mr. Rajiv, Dr. Philip, Dr. Deepak Gowell, Dr. Didi, and of course, Mr. Prashant. He could not be here, but I really want to thank him for sharing this views. So thank you very much. And I really appreciate you being here and talking to us. Now I want to I wanna hand it over to Mr. Prashant uh, to give a vote of thanks and praise. Thanks, Gurpreet. Um, I, was, I was telling Madan, two years is transformational. Um, what we would have taken possibly a decade to try and learn and change uh, has been done in these two years itself. The, the world of remote monitoring is now the new normal. It's not no longer uh, something that's going to be a thing that will actually happen and take a period of time. It's already happening right here, right now. Large hospitals are adopting it. Medium-sized hospitals are adopting it. Smaller hospitals are also adopting it. So it's not something that is only left to people who can afford it. I think the important thing is the penetration is significantly increasing. In this new normal, I guess, uh, with the manpower shortage, which, which a lot of the panelists talked about, I think it is important for us as Medtronic and uh, working with Stasis to try and offer the right solutions, which can really transform how exactly remote monitoring can be done and how we can simplify 
uh, what 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 looks like a very complex problem into something which is really meaningful, tangible, and can actually be delivered to improve the quality of outcome for patients across India. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, our, our our chair, our co-panelists as well, Dr. Deepak Goel, Dr. Dwideep Chandra, Dr. Philip Matthew, Dr. Rajiv Shukla, uh, sorry, Mr. Rajiv Shukla and Mr. Prashant Singh for joining us today. Uh, it, it was it was 90 minutes which flew like this. It absolutely flew like that. I was I was I was kind of buzzed onto every point that was actually being mentioned, and I really 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 enjoyed the session. Thank you, Mayuri, also for kind of conducting the session and helping us really learn so much in this short period of time. Back to you, Gurpreet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prashant. I really want to thank Madan for being here and encouraging us to do this event and sharing his views on the partnership also. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, all panelists and all the attendees, participants who could spend their time elsewhere, but they decided to be here for one and a half hour and learn from, and I could see a lot of chat coming about a very informative session and also thank you very much. And we would love to bring similar sessions to you in the future as well. For now, take care and bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for participating in this event and supporting us. Thank you, Medtronic. We have recorded this session and the recording will be available on our platform, Medical Learning Hub, in a few days. And we will be notifying you all via emailers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Philip. Thank you. Um, I'll be here for a few more minutes, sir, to take the poll questions. If the panelist wants to leave, please feel free to. Thank you so much, sir. I would request all the participants to please take the poll questions and share their valuable feedback with us. We have more upcoming events, and if you want to uh, be updated with it, please subscribe our newsletters and like our page on FB. So there are more events with the ventilators and COVID and many others. Thank you, sir. So we have received around 70% of the poll questions. We'll be here for two more minutes. Would we'll request all the participants to please take the poll questions.
we are here for a minute more. Request you all to please take the poll questions. So. So I'm ending. Thank you for sharing your valuable feedback with us and staying with us. Thank you so much. Ending the poll here.